Hello everyone, we are here for the third Zwift World Special Podcast with uh, with Danny and Kev again. How are you doing guys? Hey, doing very well thanks. Absolutely loving the atmosphere here in Harrogate and really excited for the races still to come. Yeah, fantastic to be here in sunny Harrogate. Sunny Harrogate, yeah. Well, um, nothing, nothing like the Zwift, Zwift Harrogate version. I think that seems to be sunny all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not so realistic with the weather. Um, unfortunately, it has been pretty wet, but... The racing has been amazing. Been red hot, hasn't it? So we're going to talk about the two junior races so far, the junior road races, and uh, the men's and, and the women's, both won by obviously huge talents, both Americans. I know, it's amazing. Obviously, America are back at the top of the table again. Uh, they're obviously doing some fantastic talent identification uh, back home, and, and this is uh, the rewards that they have now. Do you know what I think as well? I think it gives you so much motivation when you get that first medal for the nation. Mm. And when that rider then comes back to the camp, back to the hotel, and everyone's surrounded by that success, it really gives you so much, yeah, like I said, motivation to go out there and, and do it again for your nation. I know when we've been to world championships before and that first gold medal has been put on the board, all you want to do is follow them. So I think that's really helped. But yeah, they're having such an incredible championships. Well, I'm sure most of you have been watching a lot of the the world on TV, uh, and we're kind of we're, we brought to you a lot of chats from from riders. So, first chat we've got is from yeah an avid Zwifter, a bit big name in the Zwift world, Ella Harris Kev. Yeah, Ella is just an amazing story for Zwift. Uh, Twelve months ago, she was at home riding the indoor trainer on Zwift, uh, and she was lucky enough to win Zwift Academy, and now here she is riding the World Championships for her country. So, fantastic story. I was actually lucky enough as well to commentate on the tour of Colorado and I was so impressed with the way she rode I think sometimes the Zwift Academy riders have found it hard to come into the world tour peloton but she's really kind of got stuck in straight away she's riding super well she's been you know put into these big races and yeah it's been incredible to see and what a big opportunity she's got now to ride at a world championships for the first time Right, here's the chat then. All right, here we are speaking with Ella Harris. We're two days out from the World Championships. Ella, how's it feel to be in Harrogate? Pretty surreal, but exciting. Like, I've never been to an event this big before, so seeing, like, all the all the hype around the place is, is pretty cool. And it's actually, it's a pretty amazing story, isn't it? To go from Zwift Academy, what, 12 months ago to be at the World Championships, how does that feel for you? Yeah, it's, it's not quite believable. Um, I don't think I would have thought that I'd be here this time last year, but, yeah, just taking it all in and... And coming into this championship, you've had a pretty good results in racing, haven't you? Like you've had your race program has gone from quite light to being quite heavy towards the world championships, and the results have been coming, haven't they? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was pretty pleased with how I went in Colorado, and then last week in the Tour of Ardèche, even though I didn't have the greatest of luck at times, um, I felt like my fitness was really good and my legs were good. So, yeah, form wise, I think I'm in a pretty good place coming into the championships. Now, big question. Have you ridden the course on Zwift yet? No, I haven't actually. <laughs> okay, we, we still have time for that. There's, still, there's two days to go, so we can do that. That's good work. Okay, um, and leading into the race, the team for New Zealand is how many riders do you have in the women's race? We had a mighty squad of three, but now we're down to two. Yeah, me and a rider from Bigler. And um, are you aware of your role you're going to play yet, or is it going to be a bit of a free reign on the day? Not really too sure, actually. I mean, there's a limit to how much you can do with two people, but yeah, um, I'm sure we'll give the, the Dutch squad of nine a run for their money anyway. <laughs> well, look, it's pretty amazing like where you've come from and what you've done in training recently and also racing. Anything's possible on a course like this, and with the weather, what we're expecting, um, who knows what can happen for you. Yeah, exactly. We'll just get out there and see what happens, really. Now, uh, any secret dietary um, requirements that you put in place leading into into the world? We've heard about porridge with you. <laughs> yeah, well, obviously, it's you've got to stick with what you know, so it's going to be the porridge. Uh, definitely a big bowl of, of porridge in the morning before the race. Bit of peanut butter on top. There's a good selection of peanut butters in the UK. So, yeah, I'm, I'm getting into those. Um, yeah, a bit of fruit on the side as well, but... Just, yeah, sticking with what I know. Nice. And in terms of support, are your parents coming over for the race? No, they're not, no. All right, obviously this is an, an audio podcast, but I'm sitting here looking at your leg at the moment. Uh, you've, you've had a, a recent accident in a race? Yeah, um, I got a little bit excited, a bit overexcited or probably a uh, lack of concentration in the Tour of Ardèche stage uh, last week, so... With 7k to go, I was by myself, solo and fourth, and I overcooked a corner a little bit, went straight into a into a barrier at 65k an hour, and uh, it was like Philippe Gilbert style, uh, spectacularly straight over the top and down the bank on the other side. But 
yeah, a little bit stiff and sore, but it's getting better with each day. So, but also it does show that you know Kiwis are known to be hard riders, and and to to get back on the bike like you have after the accident, I think it says a lot about your character. Yeah, I've just just got to get it done. <laughs> now, if I can describe this for the listeners, I'm looking looking at uh, Ella's uh, lower left leg here. It's still oozing it's, a bit. it's like a, a 20 centimeter long by five centimeter just gash. It's uh, yeah, it's it's horrific. But anyway, she's tough. All right, let's go training. There you go. There's the familiar voice of uh, of Ella there. We, we've also got another chat with Julie Leith. Yeah, I spoke to Julie yesterday at her team hotel. Danish rider, actually the current European Madison champion. She likes to combine both track and road, which you don't actually see that often. But yeah, she absolutely loves both disciplines. She's really excited about tomorrow's road race for the women. She will be in more of a domestique role, um, having some other leaders who have got more potential of winning the race. Uh, but yeah, let's hear from Julie. So my first a full cycling podcast with Swift and my first rider that I'm talking to today is Julie Leth. Welcome to the Swift Cycling Podcast, Julie. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. Pretty excited for this weekend. Um, yeah. Looking forward to it? Yeah, looking forward to it. I think it'll be a very tough day on the bike. Good. So before we go into that about the World Championships, can you just introduce yourself to the Swift Podcast listeners? Yeah, my name is Julie Leth. I'm 20 seven years old from Denmark um, I ride both on the road and the track currently European medicine champion amazing so would you say your full focus is on the track or do you like to try and combine both the track and the road I like to combine it I guess the Danish track philosophy is more like we I think we believe more in good bike riders rather than a good road rider and a good uh, track rider so in general we, we build up a lot on the road and believe that we get a good base and high intensity from the racing and then just go on the track uh, and get the last, I guess, track preparations before championships. So how do you combine the two? Do you go on the track how many times a week versus what you do on the road? In general, I don't really go on the track uh, unless just before the big competition. So uh, yeah, I guess before the Europeans last year, I hadn't been on the track since January. And oh. I was just... I, got into it less than two weeks before um so that's yeah. pretty impressive because the riders that i speak to actually don't think you can combine the two anymore i think it's so specialist the track and the road you know you need so much speed for the track now but obviously yeah you danish can obviously do it all do you think the madison is more comparable to the road though obviously you are the european madison champion i guess that is your focus for the olympics next year yeah um but I guess from my perspective, I'd say, you know, compared to the team pursuit, which is what I focused on, it would be hard to combine the two. But I guess with the Madison, it's a longer event, you know, on off accelerations um, and maybe a bit more similar to the road. Yeah, I, yeah, of course, I haven't done the team pursuit. Uh, I think the Danish men's team pursuit also do quite a lot of road, ra both riding and racing. Um, but yeah, for sure, of course, uh, the Madison is more of an endurance event and it's a uh, 120 laps now, I believe. So it's quite a long event, and I believe that the the fitness I get from the road really benefit me in the longer events. But yeah, for sure, for the Olympics, I will be doing a bit more track work uh, specifically uh, going into it. So we will see. I've only just yeah been back on the track for a year now. So uh, for me, it's been working out pretty well, and I felt really good going into the spring after the 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 track season i think it just gives me a lot of speed which i really find benefits me when you have to make the echelons or the many small accelerations going into the hills and cobble sections but also for me i've been a domestique for a lot of years and i guess for me it was really important to get something that was i'm doing it for me i'm not doing it for anyone else and it really adds uh i'm super motivated for this and i really enjoy having this thing that's mine and i'm not doing it to so anyone else than myself and not won the podium yeah so for any of you listeners that don't know i obviously rode on the road with julie and i actually didn't ride ever in a team with you did i i think you did ride for wiggle but it wasn't in the same year that i no. did 
and Julie's one of the super domestiques on the road. So for me personally, when I saw Julie win the Madison at the Europeans, I was so, so happy because, you know, you get dom domestiques on the road and they don't get the praise that they deserve. So as you say, obviously this is really for you. Um, so for next year, you can really focus on the Olympics. And I guess a medal would be an aim and a realistic goal, or is it the goal that you are going for? Yeah, I mean, I think we would be stupid not to. Um, we've had such an uh, amazing start to this project. The Madison last year was, as I said, my first one at the Europeans, and we had so many podiums. So, of course, I know now it's just the level is just rising and it's going to be really, really tough. But, of course, I would, <laughs> yeah, I would love to leave the Olympics with uh, a medal. But, truth be said, I think I watched my first Olympics in like. 2000 or 2004 and I was doing track and field at that point and I went straight to my team and I said I'm, you know what I think when we grow up we should all go to the Olympics <laughs> I bit like it. me <laughs> I loved it like it's always been a dream of mine and it's never really been in the cards so just the fact that it's such a realistic goal now is really uh, exciting for me well I hope you get a medal and that will be along with Amelie Deirdrickson your teammate who uh, won the Road World Championships in 2016. 16, Doha. Doha, yeah, I actually rode that race myself. So obviously you won the European Madison with Amelie Diedrichsen, who won the World Road Championships in 2016 in Doha. That was a race that I rode myself. Obviously it'll be a fight between a few of you for the spots. Um, so moving on to the road worlds now, that's why we're here in Harrogate. What do you think of the course? Um, what do you think of Harrogate and what have you seen so far? I've seen not a lot of flat roads. <laughs> <laughs> brutal. <laughs> it's pretty brutal. I feel like it's going to be a savage race. I'm not going to lie. I didn't see the course and was like, wow, they built this for me. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think it would be a really exciting race. Uh, I watched a junior men's race today, which was quite cool, but also showed how brutal the road around here is. Um, so should be pretty, pretty tough. Um, I'm excited for it. It's, yeah, it's always special to ride a world championships. And I think... Well, I believe uh, that the Brits really love cycling, which is nice. And you feel it when you're doing the track here. And when I did women's tour, like there's so many spectators out. So, yeah, Saturday and Sunday, I expect a lot of crowds. I, I see it's going to rain a lot on Sunday, but <laughs> I feel like it's not going to stop the Brits. You're used to it. Yeah, exactly. And did you ride the race on Zwift before you got to Harrogate? I did. Um, I had a rainy day in Girona. So I thought, ah, I didn't, I didn't go to Spain to ride in the rain. <laughs> I got a bit soft. Um, so I thought, why not? Uh, and I set myself up. And I actually didn't even think. I just pressed start and it went on to the world's course. And I was like, well, I'm going in a week and a half. So why not was, try it? <laughs> exactly. So I had a look at it and yeah. And now riding the finishing circuit, having ridden it on Zwift, do you think it is super realistic? compared to what you did ride I know you rode it on an easy day so maybe it's a bit different um, but were you impressed with how comparable it was I mean I for sure uh, recognized some of it which was quite nice like I did see oh now this downhill is coming now the hill so I didn't look so much into the course before but I at least knew uh, I'm gonna what sort of what I was gonna expect so that was quite cool oh yeah and, uh, that's cool yeah and what will your role be on Saturday? Are you going to be in the domestic role or where I where I almost always am <laughs> yeah. on the road, not on the track? <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm not going to give away our team plan, but I think so. I think we're going to have our hands full uh, Saturday. But I think we did prove before that um, yeah, we've been underdogs and come away with pretty great results. Uh, yeah, Amalia, she podium in both Doha where she won but also in, in Bergen which was maybe not of course people would have said before that was suited for her so yeah we have we have some strong cards for you unfortunately we just arrived and not being able to go here because of a concussion so we're five girls but yeah if we ride as a unit hopefully we'll get a nice result yeah exactly in the uh, preview that we did of the Worlds we were actually talking about how 
the Dutch team are probably the most dominant, but actually how, because they are so strong, that can actually work, you know, not in their favour because a lot of them can win and want to win. And the teams that can actually ride together and just have one goal can actually sometimes come out on top and better. So would you agree with that? Do you think the Dutch will be the ones to beat? Uh, I think they're always the ones to beat, um, which they've proven, proven but, uh, the last few years. But there's for sure other candidates as well. And I think anyway, the Dutch, I, they have a lot of cards to play, but I do think they also any way often come away with a, a good result because they do sacrifice themselves and yeah it must be tough because they have a lot of people who, who could become world champions but the, the fact is you need to work together um cycling is a team sport it, even if only one person ends up on the podium um but yeah it should be exciting i guess lizzie dyknen is from here so I, I guess she has a point to prove and has come back from her pregnancy super super strong so that should be exciting to see what she can do on home roads and there's yeah there's so many strong girls i think just in general the level of women's cycling is so high and uh, yeah it just proves us for some really exciting races where not just one country is dominant one point i did note down for any of you that don't know is that julie other half is Lassie Hansen, um, an um, amazing track rider. Is he riding the road? I know he has combined the two in pre in previous years. Is he also riding this year? He's not doing this World Championships. He's still riding the road. Still also going for the Olympics <laughs> on the track. So we will do that together, hopefully. Uh, so that should be exciting. Do uh, you train together? Sometimes. <laughs> yeah, sometimes. <laughs> Let's be realistic. <laughs> yeah, he... He waits for me sometimes, and if he has a really bad day, I wait for him. And do you ever argue <laughs> on the bike? <laughs> a really bad day? <laughs> Come on, Julie, back yourself. I'm sure you can beat him a few times. Yeah. It has, it has happened. Sorry, Lassa. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think we don't argue that much on the bike. Um, maybe it's just me, you know, if I'm like kind of fighting or whatever. I guess everyone, <laughs> if they're on a bad day, they're not really. But I, I think at the end, I just know maybe we just shouldn't talk at this point. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty good at saying, okay, I'm going to just be sitting in the wheel now. And I'm like, bring me home, please. <laughs> <laughs> and you can be friends again when you get back. Exactly. After I've had food. Of so. course. Hangry. That's what we call it in the UK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hungry and angry at the same time. Amazing. And any off-season plans? I know at this time of the year, everyone's chatting before the World Championships. One, what they're going to do the night after the World Championships. So I'm hoping you're going to come down to the Zwift House, which is has an epic vibe around it. DJs will be really cool. But then also everyone's talking about where they're going on holiday um, and plans for the winter. But obviously with the track, is that a bit different? Any plans for holidays or breaks? Um, not really yet. I think straight after I'm going into track mode, I've got the Europeans coming up just after. So uh, that will be first priority. And then we see, um, I will have a bit of a break, but unfortunately I'm not sure it's at the same time as Lassus. So I don't think- The be. struggles of the, the two struggle. athletes together. Yeah, the struggle is real. We will not see each other. So at least he will. He's not going to get tired of me anytime soon because he's not going to see me. That's Distance something. makes the heart grow fonder, we say. <laughs> <laughs> well thanks that's been an amazing chat thanks julie good luck on saturday and then good luck for the rest of your track season it's been a pleasure talking to you it's nice to see you again after i haven't been in the women's peloton for a while um but yeah thank you for chatting to us on the zwift coaching podcast thank you that was mine interesting little comment there about riding with her partner lassie <laughs> yeah. um obviously there's a lot of a uh, lot of couples zwift and cycle together yeah, for sure. I know me and you Zwift together and Zwifting together is definitely better than riding together outside. I know sometimes when we ride outside, it doesn't always end well. But yeah, as Julie said, they like to train together sometimes and she can sometimes beat him when he's having a bad day. She was hoping he wouldn't be listening. <laughs> but yeah, it was a really nice chat. Next up then, again, we're kind of a bit of a, a whirlwind here flying through all these interviews, but there's so much good content out there. It'd be a shame not to bring it to you. Um, also caught up with Danny with friend, uh, French rider, 
Uh, Audrey. Yeah, Audrey Cordon Rago, uh, the French rider. I was lucky enough to ride in a team with her a couple of years ago. She's a super domestique and known in the peloton to, you know, given be given a job to do and just do it to her full potential and really race her heart out for other people and this is a really interesting chat about how she thinks the worlds will play out tomorrow so let's hear from audrey now so second zwift podcast and i'm very delighted to be joined by the one and only audrey cordon rago she is a french rider rides for the new team trek segafredo i was lucky enough to be in a team with audrey when we rode for the wiggle team a couple of years ago a super domestic thanks for joining us audrey Thanks for asking. It's really nice to to talk about those worlds and to talk with you, Danny, because I think it's a long time we didn't see each other. So it's really nice. I know. Very nice to, to chat to you again. And for the listeners who don't know you, can you just give us a quick overview of who you are, uh, what type of rider you are and what you think about Harrogate? Uh, so I'm French, as you said, and I'm coming also from Bretagne, so the little Bretagne. Um, and um, yeah, I'm more a classic rider and I'm 30 years old, so I'm, I'm a pretty experienced rider as well. Um, I'm now riding for 10 years as a pro and uh, how, I, uh, how, I, um, how I like Arrogate, actually I liked it because uh, I came here several times and the first time was in 2017 uh, for Tour of Yorkshire. And uh, yeah, I really like this stage. It was really nice, and uh, I remember chasing so hard you, Danny. And uh, and unfortunately for you to to bridge on you on the last uh, couple of kilometers. And um, yeah, it's been a really good memory here, and uh, I hope to to make it even more uh, beautiful tomorrow. I definitely remember when you did catch me. I was hoping that would be one of my biggest results. But for those of you that don't know, I was away um, in a break with. Lizzie Dygman and Anna van der Breggen and we got exactly. with a few hundred meters to go um but yeah we won't go into that <laughs> <laughs> um you're also known as a, an extremely powerful time trial rider I know you rode the individual time trial a few days ago how was that for you did you enjoy the course yeah, I really liked the course. Um, it was really a course that suited me really well. Unfortunately, I didn't have so good sensations on on Tuesday and I didn't do well. But, you know, it, it is what it is. Sometimes uh, you just think you, you're you ready and, and you're just in a bad day. So um, I turned the page pretty quick and now I'm just focused on, on Saturday. Amazing. And as a super domestique, will you get the chance in the French team? I know you are one of the strongest riders in your team for France. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, this is this is really nice for me to to be with the national team because uh, uh, yeah, I will be one of the leaders. Uh, we are two leaders with uh, the other uh, rider from Movie Star Organic, and uh, yeah, we 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 will be really protected by the others, and uh, we will get the chance to try to get a result and to to be on on one of the spots on the podium. So um, yeah, it, it's a role who is changing a little bit uh, compared to to when I'm racing with the with my team and. And it's really nice to 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 get the chance to to try something that, that's great to hear because i know obviously from having ridden with you and watching the world tour races throughout the year how hard you work for other people so i think it's it's really nice when riders like yourself get that chance in such a high profile event or the most high profile event such as the world championship so i definitely wish you all the best with the world um who do you Thank think you. the biggest uh your biggest rivals will be out there on the course on us uh, uh, tomorrow. Uh, as always, you know, uh, Olin is, is really the, the team to, to look for. Um, they they can all win this race. But I also think uh, with Chloe Dyger in this shape at the moment, it would be really, really interesting to see how she can make it and how she can um, how she can race out there. So uh, she also has a super, super strong team around her. Uh, so basically in my opinion those two teams will be the one we have to look for and then uh, we are several teams with good riders like I'm thinking about Italy of course Germany uh, Australia so yeah I think you know we will be like um, looking for them and and then maybe trying something um, in the end of the race if we're still there but it will be really interesting to see how those two teams um, will ride and will race. 
Yeah, I, I actually totally agree with you. I think it's quite an open race and I think it'll be quite attritional with the circuit. I think there'll be riders going out the back. It'll be super aggressive from the start. Obviously, the weather's going to probably play a big role in the race as well and positioning is, is going to be vital coming into the finishing circuit. Yeah, exactly. In my opinion, the weather will be a big treat because um, it should be 40k per hour wind. So uh, we all know that on those small on those small roads, uh, if you're not in a good place, then on the bench, then it's, it can be really difficult if you need to um, to bridge the gaps and the gaps and the gaps, and then in the end you have no power, even if you're the strongest. So um, tactically, you need to be always focused and always uh, in the in the right place at the right moment, also to escape the the, the crashes and uh, and the problems. So yeah, you need to be focused from the start. You can't stay in the back for long. You can't. Uh, just wait for the the, the difficulties because uh, it will be really really hard from from the start from K zero for sure. Amazing insight, and I'm sure it's going to be an absolute spectacle to watch. And I'm going to be watching. Unfortunately, this year I would love to be in it, but obviously have retired from professional cycling. But we'll wrap up there. Thank you so much for joining us on the Zwift podcast, Audrey. That was really really insightful, and we wish you all the best of luck for the race tomorrow. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I hope we can see each other tomorrow <laughs> evening then. <laughs> for sure, for a big party, hopefully, at the, exactly. Zwift, at the Zwift House. Make sure you come along. Yeah. It's going to be a big party. Cool. Yeah, why not? <laughs> Thanks, Audrey. I mean, Audrey just mentioned there she's 30, one of the older, more experienced riders. You know, we, we know female riders get, get stronger with, with, with age as they go on. Um, what Why is that, Kev? I think it's... A lot of it is opportunity as well. Uh, Daniel probably have more of a comment on this than me, but it's it's harder to to get through the ranks. And also, actually, I think that's basically education. Mm. A lot of uh, young females chase education first before their career, uh, whereas young male bike riders will leave school early to chase that bike riding career. Um, Danny, interested in your thoughts on that? Yeah, definitely. I think it's actually a mixture, a combination of a, a lot of different reasons, I think, as well physiologically is that the word that's the word word. that'll do (laughs) as a female on the bike you actually do get stronger and fitter throughout your years um and also like you said a lot do carry on with education and then really learn and and set their pathway through you know the the racing and set themselves president and and their roles within the team so i think that's what audrey's done she's got so much experience and i know she's got so much respect in the peloton as well and there's a lot of girls now that are at the top of their game and they are in their 30s look at Annemiek van Vluten for example Lizzie Dijgenen these favorites are the older riders um so yeah a lot of different reasons for that I think um and also knowing yourself as a rider I know I learned so much about my body my training techniques what worked for me what didn't work for me as well so I think that was a a, another reason why you do see um, women going on into their 30s and being at the top of their game but that was a really interesting chat and just following following on from that too what we're seeing now at the other end of the spectrum with the juniors now is that teams are snapping up riders from the junior ranks now so we've seen in these championships the place getters in the men's junior event have been snapped up by professional teams. It's almost becoming like soccer where you want to grab the riders as young as you can, have them come through your, your pathways and develop them that way. So it does show that uh, it is possible to make a career early in the sport uh, and it does show that the interest is there. And there's examples in uh, obviously professional racing where the young guys are winning the biggest races in the world. Well, Bernard Eagle is obviously the, the big example. Uh, Podica, who won Tour of California uh, and placed in Vuelta as well. So these young guys that are 19, 20, 21 years old are winning the biggest races because they have the opportunity to do that now. Yeah, Remco, Van der Poel. Rem, of another, course. Another one. I think that's what's so amazing about cycling. You can beat your top of top of your game whether you're 19 or or 35 years old I think that's what's so nice you know if you're a youngster looking up to these riders and you've got a role model then great you can still be there even if you're starting the sport late I started the sport at at 16 which is I guess relatively relatively late in in sporting terms and other sports you know if you're not at the top of your game by 18 there's no chance you're going to make it so that's what's really nice about cycling if you're inspired by watching racing still in your 20s there's still no reason why you technically couldn't be world class in the sport 
Yeah. But for those younger guys as well, I think it's so important to have that support network around them. Because you've got a guy 19, goes pro, suddenly got a fairly chunky contract, you know, financially earning a lot more money than his friends from school. You mm. know, he's suddenly in this world. It's, it's, it's not normal. Um, and also just you know, monitoring your, your progress, having a good coach and you know, so, yeah, support staff around you. I think that's obviously vital. Yeah, we'll look at Dimension Data for next year. They've signed a 30-year-old who's just made his debut in the pro ranks and a 23-year-old, so there's two extremes there. That's unusual, eh? 30-year-old Neopro. I think it must be close to a record. It'd have to be 30-year-old Neopro. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's fantastic. So for all you Zwifters out there in your, in your late 20s, it's not, not too late to go pro, <laughs> I guess is the message. Yeah. Um, but la- last night in, in Harrogate at the Zwift House, we had arguably the, yeah, the second best podcast I've been calling it in, in the world, <laughs> maybe, uh, the, the What's Occurring podcast, um, hosted by Luke, my, my brother, and Geraint Thomas. Uh, and they recorded it live from the Zwift House. So we had a little, little catch up with those offline before the podcast. All right. Here at the Zwift House with uh, two other Welsh boys, Luke and G, hosts of second best podcast in town. What's occurring? What what is it all about, boys? <laughs> well, it's uh, it all came about with Luke. Really, it was his idea about just chat about racing and stuff, really, and just how what we go through and just give our experiences in a bit of a different way, you know. So it's not uh, you know through journalists basically who sort of like to put their own spin on things. So we just have a chat, say how it is, and that's it, really. Just not too sure where it's going to go. It just started recently and just uh, going from there, really. And Luke, your, uh, your role would have been, if you were in the world, a uh, support rider for Swifty, I, I, I presume. Give us a bit of an insight into what, what does a domestic, what is a support, support rider all about? What makes a good, good support rider? I think it's a big uh, range of things you can do to support your leader. Um, I think, you know, the obvious answer is like food and water, but that's, that's pretty minor. It's essentially just being a wingman, being next to him, um, you always say if you can't if you can't touch your leader while you're on the bike you're too far away from him so it's always being within you know anything he needs any moment um, essentially it's you know we all know keeping uh, your leader protected out of the wind is pretty much the main thing and uh, trying to put him in the right place at the right time so you use your, your energy and he can save his I think it's the, is the, the main role of a domestique and what about all these Southern Europeans and the Aussies used to good weather? Obviously, it's pretty going to be pretty tougher on Sunday for the men's road race. It's got to favour the the harder North European and Brit. Yeah, but I've got used to this weather in South of France, to be honest. And I'm uh, I was swinging today in the rain. <laughs> but uh, I saw you after you had a big balaclava on or something. Yeah, yeah, I was wrapped up. But uh, no, I think you're right. Really, I think uh, a lot of the guys will be. Uh, won't thrive in this this weather. I think Swifty loves it. To be honest, all the Brits are used to it, really. You know, it's, we're, we're born here, you know. Um, I think uh, people like Christoph and those type of guys, really. Um, but yeah, it's definitely going to be a war of attrition, that's for sure. Lovely. And just to wrap up, Luke, recent dad, I'll say recent dad, not recent, um, but you're now a dad. Has that changed your outlook on sport and, and, and life? So I think Ro- Rowan Dennis put a photo just before the time trial on Instagram saying, you know, this is what matters and it was his little boy. Has that changed? Because there's a lot of dads who ride Zwift. No, I think for me, it hasn't really changed anything. I think uh, it's just taught me you got to have the ability to kind of switch on and switch off from dad to bike rider, from bike rider to dad. And, and, you know, when you're on the, the start line and when you're racing, you know, you're a bike rider. And then when you go home, you're your dad. And I think being able to switch from one to another and, you know, not let one affect the other is... Um, is the way I try and approach it and seems to work quite well. And you know, if you worry about things that can go wrong on the bike and you, know, you have a crash or an accident and that's going to affect dad life, then, you know, it's going to set you back. So just try and switch off from one and switch on to the next is uh, the, way, the approach I've tried to take and that's worked quite well. All right, well, um, good luck for Sunday, G, and let's get stuck into the What's Occurring podcast. Uh, yeah, make sure you tune in. Or, where is it? iTunes, SoundCloud, all the usual oh, everywhere, places? Everywhere. 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 All Global. the best ones, all the best yeah, ones. Just the best ones. All right, nice one. Um, but that, a lot of their chat was centered around the world. So I think we'll, we'll dive in and play you some of their, some of their podcast. What's going, Bert? No, a lot, Bert. What's occurring? Here we are. Yeah, first time we've done this with a uh, live audience. Normally it's just uh, my wife and your son. Yeah, me, you and, on a, me, you, me and you in a hotel bed, all cuddled up. So yeah. what's, uh, what's occurring is going global. It's uh, nice to see so many people come here. Um, we'll start, obviously what we're going to do now is just talk for a little bit um, and then 
we'll start recording and this will go out as a as a podcast um so it'll be cut and edited so don't be a hero and shout something stupid because you'll get edited out <laughs> so uh yeah we'll we'll get going from now sound yeah crack on what's occurring but oh not a lot just uh went out for a ride today did uh, the so the road race on Sunday we do a big loop 180k and then we do seven 14k laps and we did the big loop today well the first 50k was in the car and then we started d- during a downpour which is lovely and uh, it's solid roads though it's uh, narrow twisty up and down um, Swifty was saying oh yeah there's loads of corners you don't have to break for people are going to be breaking blah 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 there's a lot of corners you got to break for I'm telling you that now <laughs> I, I wasn't going to go around them but, but anyway it was a uh, it's solid, and, and the race on Sunday is going to be brutal. Yeah, it's going to blow to bits. And Swifty, uh, he did a recon, what, six months ago now. And that's one of the first things he said. It was these bends that you don't have to break for. He's, he's yeah. so dialed in on that that everyone else is going to break, and the GB team's just going to fly around these bends. So <laughs> that's, like, yeah. that's one thing he was super excited about. Mad man. But yeah, I think... Uh, he's up for it. He'll be our leader. We've still got Teo, who, who come out of the Vuelta really well as well and Yatesy and then the other three of us will be there to help those boys do as best they can so um, domestic role do you remember yeah. what to do I think so yeah well, that, it hasn't been that long since you know in, in the tour and stuff but um, I did go back for bottles in tour Germany and then it split which wasn't the best idea so uh, but yeah I think uh, the main thing with the world as well we don't have race radio so I think that'll probably be an advantage for us because we're so used to racing with each other five of us are in Ineos anyway but, you know, especially me, Stannard, and Swifty, we've grown up racing together. So that'll be an advantage to us, I think, as well. But I think that's, that can be underrated as well, can't it, as an advantage. I think when you have, you know, a lot of nations, just a team of individuals. But if you can really be a team where, like, even when we're racing, you know, for our trade team, for Ineos, a lot of the time we don't actually talk that much to each other because we're just on the same wavelength, aren't we? So if, if, th- if we can, well, if you guys as a nation can can replicate that on Sunday and really come together as a team then you know that's already one one step ahead in it really um, but yeah what do you the weather's terrible isn't it and personally <laughs> on Sunday I'm going to wake up be an armchair fan wake up a few beers sit on my sofa and I'm so happy it's raining yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah I can imagine um, I'm windy I'm windy how's yeah. that going to affect it Oh. It, it was windy today as well and uh, it depends which way the wind's going over the top of the last climb there's a lot of crosswind but then it's still 60k to go but then it's quite big roads after that but if it's still sort of like if the wind's in the right direction it'll just make it hard and I'm not sure completely kick off it might but it's more just the rain you know especially if it rains early on and it's going to be like over 7 hour race so it's definitely going to take its toll that but Swifty's doing the rain dance every night he's well up for it so just going to have to bite the bullet and uh, just do it. Yeah, that's another thing Swifty said. As soon as the Worlds run Harrogate, all these, you know, when they announced it a couple of years ago, oh, it could be raining, it could be raining. Imagine it was raining. Oh, I'd love it to rain. And he hasn't oh, mate, he's in. bouncing off the walls. He's just, like, so excited about this. So he only lives, like, I don't know, an hour down the road and West Yorkshire, in it, And, you know, Sheffield Steel and all that crap. He's well into it. Yeah, Yorkshire grit. I'll bet I'll better watch out, actually, shouldn't I? <laughs> There's more of them Sheffield than Grit and all that, yeah. Downing Brothers and then, yeah. <laughs> but anyway. So that's... Yeah, go on. No, I was going to just ask for some questions. Well, I was going to do the same. Oh, sweet. <laughs> go on then. See? Same wavelength. <laughs> so yeah, we'll an- oh, uh, answer up to questions. Open it up. Yeah, it's a family show. Nothing too rude. Uh, but yeah, far away. So let's see. A hand at the front there. Okay. Wonder Rover. It's going to keep me fit. Get me steps up, chaps. Oh, thanks very much indeed, Luke. Oh, top lad. Who's the favourite and who's the biggest threat on Sunday? Oh, uh, we went through this briefly on the last pod, but I can't remember. I think I said Tim Wellens if it's raining because he always goes well in bad weather. Obviously, Sagan Van Avermaet, the, the, the main guys stand out. Van der Poel. Um, be interesting to see how he goes. Uh, I think uh, someone we didn't mention, actually, who I realised, we saw him today, was Christoph. I think he's... Uh, he just loves eating up the miles in training, and I think the distance won't do him any harm. He loves the bad weather, being Norwegian, so he'll be right up there as well, for sure. And Christoph is, um, so you speak to Halverson, one of our teammates who's Norwegian, and in the out-and-out sprints, 
perhaps Kristoff isn't the fastest now, but one interesting thing that Halverson says is Kristoff is the type of rider. He doesn't... His, his watts towards the end of a, um, a long race don't, don't, don't drop off. So what he'll do after four hours, he can still do after six or seven, which, you know, for a race like that, which is going to be six, seven hours... That's one thing. You look at like Gent Wevelgum this year, like a brutal race on all day, crosswinds, and normally he'd never, you know, smash a bunch sprint like he did, and he absolutely nailed it. So that's some one thing for Christoph is that if it has been a hard race and there's someone faster on paper in that group, after a long hard race, he can back up with a really good sprint. So yeah, we forgot about him, him didn't we? Yeah. yeah. Next up, gentleman at the front there. On the circuit, where do you think the attack will, the decisive, decisive attack will be? Uh, I think the race winning attack will probably come down to the very last lap up the very last like little drag well not a drag but the little climb um, I just think yeah I think there'll be a few attacks in as always with two three to go sort of like you got your leaders and then the guys under that so for instance Belgium I'm guessing Van Avermaet is going to be the leader and then maybe someone like Gilbert may go two three laps to go um, but then the real hitters We'll all wait, really, for the, the crunch in the final. Um, and I think someone like Van der Poel, maybe, or I don't know, we'll try on that long drag, and I think it's just whatever anyone's got left there, really. And it'll be a sprint, but it'll, it'll be a slow-motion sort of sprint, I think. Sorry? When they, come, when they come down to Oak Beck and then the, the climb towards Valley Drive would be a quite a good one to really put some power yeah he put you in the team car mate give him a few tips out yeah, on the road yeah. just what do you reckon I need Google like, Maps a local lad. I need Google Maps yeah that one that's a drag up to the finish for there out that corner yeah yeah uh, anyway old, old Beck up the Valley Drive thanks and for the information mate maybe maybe just send him an email with some Hill. yeah with some GPX files that, that'd be great um <laughs> They Thanks very much, mate. They nice did work. a bit of re- they did a bit of recon today, but they didn't learn all the street names, unfortunately. <laughs> St- we could write them down, stick them on your stem. Yeah. <laughs> Near the house with the blue front door, and then there's that post box on the left. That's the one. Yeah. <laughs> there. Next up, let's have some hands. Okay, a gentleman at the front there. Have you got any waterproof glue for your tubs? <laughs> oh, don't get that in my head now. I don't know. <laughs> Mate, I I probably know the least about bikes in the whole team, I would have thought. Like, just for me, I, like you guys with shovels, like a bike's a bike, you know? Or a spade. That's what you're saying, eh? Up here, up north? Spade's a spade. Did you say that? Who says that? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I think uh, it'd be all right. Yeah, whoever stuck them on, I hope. Yeah. Okay, from tubs to something else. Anybody else got any questions? Okay, just move around over here, get me steps up. Fast on my feet, luckily. Uh, toughest climb, you think, in this country? Toughest climb in this country. So not necessarily a world's question. Well, well, the steepest hill is in Wales, isn't it? It just got... The steepest climb in the world is now in Wales, isn't it? It got... Um, yeah, in Harlem. G- GCN, yeah. yeah. That was on there, so that's the steepest climb. But uh, probably something in Wales, at the Black Mountain, somewhere around the back there. But... Uh, Tougher side than in the UK. Oh, now you're asking me. Put me on the spot there. Uh, I'd say some of the toughest climbs are in Yorkshire. Tory Yorkshire. Um, I remember racing one day there, and it was four and a half thousand metres climbing. Um, I don't know the actual names of the climb, but certainly I think Yorkshire has some of the toughest climbs because, you know, not only are they steep, they're you know they're long. But um, that's one thing we lack in the UK, isn't it? Is is the the climbs with the length, you know, that you see in the Alps or Pyrenees, 10, 20, 30k, but certainly, you know, in the UK, what we do make up for is, uh, is, is the gradient, and you have these kind of brick walls, but uh, to nail it with one climb uh, is a tough one, but I think, uh, yeah, the Yorkshire area is, is the toughest area. It's a pretty steep climbs in Wales, though, Devil's Staircase, the bulky grows. Yeah, I think a lot of it depends how you're feeling as well, like November, a lot of climbs feel hard, um, but, you know, when you... July when it gets to the tour you know you're kind of feeling a lot better than I don't ride here so but uh, I think the hardest one I've kind of raced up I guess in Tour Britain when I've been a bit nailed is uh, that one in Swansea is it Constitution Hill yeah. it's like cobbled and that was that was solid um, off the top of my head anyway 
But to be honest, I haven't raced that much in the UK, which is kind of a shame. But uh, yeah, maybe I'll do Yorkshire one one point. Tumble, yeah, that's that's got to be up there. Tumbles are, yeah. Yeah, tumbles up there, and it's well so. We'll put that one up there. Hardest, hardest climb in the UK, tumble. As, as G mentioned there, his role is, you know, he is working for Ben Swift. I think he's me the, the biggest British hope of a medal. We, I think a couple of days into the championship now, Britain will be hoping for maybe perhaps some more, more metal than we would have we've achieved so far. Yeah, I don't think it's been the best championship so far. No. So a lot of pressure will be on. Uh, the likes of Lizzie Dagnan tomorrow and Ben Swift on Sunday. And it was interesting listening to Luke and G. I think the weatherman's definitely listening to Ben because I think he's been hoping for rain for this race. Um, and yeah, it's not looking great, the forecast for Sunday. So uh, hopefully Ben's rubbing his hands together and bring, can bring some metal back for the GB team. Kev, Kev sitting here with a big smile on his <laughs> face with his gold medal from Rowan Dennis. Well, uh, I'm actually on pro GB as well, obviously with Alex Dowsett, so yeah. I'm happy for GB to be up there and, and to snag that second place in the time trial for Tokyo. That's what that meant for, for the team GB. Yeah, I think that was, you know, a real win from the GB camp, having mm. Alex in fifth in the time trial. Like you said, that means they've qualified two spots for the time trial for the Olympics next year. Um, so, yeah, good job, Alex. Just, just before we wrap up, um, obviously the two races that we've had since the last podcast have been the two the two juniors junior races and just to touch on how aggressively they rode and I guess the importance for, for kids of, of leg speed you know, there's a couple of sections where they're all stretched out and they are pedaling quickly they're, they're, they're pedaling so quickly and that importance of leg speed for youngsters and learning to pedal um, and I would say you know if you're, if you're in trouble in, in a bike race you can't push away out of it you can only pedal your way out of it and it sounds a bit a bit simple saying but you know there's no point in grind, grinding in a big gear and you just gotta you gotta keep pedaling and yeah pedal, pedal your way out of it yeah for sure and for those of you that don't know in the junior ranks you're actually on restricted gears so they're not using the same gear ratios as the elites um, and that's just to protect them when they're so young um, so I think it is so so important to be able to ride smoothly with a fast cadence and I think that's why it's so important for these youngsters to be on the track and why you see so many young riders who are good on the track then transfer on onto the road because they get that smooth pedaling style and they can really transfer the power through the pedals most efficiently. Would you agree, Kev? I was just going to say, though, ironically, the US is thinking about removing that rule of gear restrictions. Let, let, let them push the, push the gear they, they feel most, com most comfortable at. So I definitely agree with what you're saying. I do believe in restricted gears uh, just to, to build that uh, neurological pathways and that efficiency. But... Obviously, the expanding countries looking at other, met other methods. Yeah, I wouldn't really argue with that. I think, yeah, why not, in a way, let them ride the gears that they're ultimately going to use when mm. they're older? But I think because they are currently restricted, that's why it is so, so important to be able to mm. ride with a fast cadence. Because ultimately, if there is going to be that restriction, when the speeds get upwards of 50 kilometers an hour they're going to be pedaling at 110 120 revs per minute mm, yeah and just to put a big context on it the restricted gear is 100 inches so it's 52 14 mm. so most bikes come with a 53 front ring so put it in into that 53 and obviously don't put it in the 11 find the 14 and that gives you a feel for it and you see these juniors you know head, heading on, on the flat at you know 50k an hour not easy to do on those gears for most of us. You can spot a junior a mile away, can't you? you can, can't you? Like that. Yeah. you can indeed. Yeah, so get on Zwift and try it. Try five minutes at 110 RPM plus and you'll have sore legs after, I can guarantee it. There's a good session. There's a good session. Well, I think Megan Yastrab, who won the, won the women's, and Quinn Simmons, uh, with the two American gold medal winners, they're both going to be racing on Zwift this evening in the Zwift Draft House. So we'll, we'll hopefully nab them for a quick interview, a couple of words. Can't promise anything. Um, hopefully tomorrow's episode will have a couple of comments from those future stars. That'll be really cool. I'm really excited to, to watch them race on, on Zwift tonight. I think they're still going to have sore legs, but I think we're yeah. in for some very <laughs> exciting racing. And those juniors are also our future eSport races, aren't they? Where there's obviously a career to be made in that. Yeah, it's so, so exciting that obviously it was announced yesterday there's going to be an e-racing world championships and i've already said that i might potentially come out of retirement just for e-racing e um but yeah it's super exciting a new discipline of cycling and rainbow jerseys to be had absolutely all right guys good to chat catch up tomorrow can't wait thanks
Awesome. Do it again tomorrow.